those who just joined us. This is the third day of the public program of the Ukrainian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. We have a series of four events within this fall. This is the first one, the next will happen in October and November. Today, uh, the topic for today's event is how do we decolonize art? And for three days, we have been speaking with the experts from all over the world, um, artists, art professionals, um, critics, curators, writers, scholars, about what, how decoloniality relates to art, and especially in these challenging times when Ukraine is invaded by Russia and the world is basically facing the, the catastrophe uh, unseen uh, from the Second World War. Uh, we have had already a number of discussions and a keynote and uh, also a wonderful screening program. And uh, today we will close this, um, this program. We will have a lecture dedicated to Ukrainian artistic response to the events. Um, and uh, then the final discussion right afterwards. Well, not right afterwards. We will have the question and answer, a little break, and then the discussion. And now I would like to invite to the stage and pass the mic to Katarina Botanova, a Ukrainian curator and art critic, co-curator of Culturescapes Festival, uh, the Swiss Festival. Uh, and uh, yeah, Kata, a word to you. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I apologize for a little delay. Uh, I had some technical issue. One of the slides was compromised and it was about the, the dream and you know the dreams should not be compromised so we decided to dedicate some time to solving the issue but now it's solved and um, I wanted to start with saying that I'm very grateful to the organizers and to my colleagues for this two days of very intense listening and talking and sharing uh, and you know thought-provoking discussions it was amazingly fruitful and it also made me feel that what I prepared as a lecture uh, will not fall somewhere outside of a discussion but actually land very much into what we together um, have been building here for two days. And um, I want to start here in Venice and um, say that this year my personal Venice Biennale started with a lineup of pictures on the social media. I was also invited to the opening, but I didn't make it. But I could follow on social media, and there was uh, there was just three, many, many pictures of a middle finger against the background of a closed and empty Russian pavilion. So for me, here it was. The two months after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, European geopolitics in a nutshell. Superpowers and empires do not disappear completely. They can turn silent for a moment if forced to do so, but they will not let go of their space <clears throat> and by this, of their presence and visibility. In 2022, the Venice Biennale looks like a living metaphor for the power relations behind the war that ravages Ukraine. The West helping Ukraine with one hand, but still somehow keeping the space for Russia, maybe in the hope for the good Russians to come. Russia doing its own business as usual, while being quite sure that its presence in the global cultural space is secure no matter what it does. Ukraine is fighting on every front, including the cultural one. It would sound like a plot for a pathetic novel or a provocative art project if it wasn't so real. While the Russian pavilion, built in 1914 with the money of Ukrainian art collector and patron of the arts, Bogdan Fomenko, stays closed due to the refusal to participate on the side of curator and the artist, the Ukrainian pavilion becomes more than a space and even more than an artwork, but a story of tremendous effort, risks, and a persistence of its curators, artists, and the entire team. The Fountain of Exhaustion, Aqua Alta, by Kharkiv artist Pavlo Makov is uh, an object consisting of a system of copper funnels channeling the water from top to bottom, so that the flow gradually diminishes. It's installed in one of the pass-through spaces in Arsenale, uh, rented by the countries that do not have their own pavilion in Giardini, but still want to be close to the physical center of the Biennale. Through the surrounding story, the fountain becomes a narrative of resilience, emancipation, and a fight for cultural and political agency, calling for solidarity and care. As the water runs through the funnels, splitting itself in smaller and smaller streams, 
It carries multiple overlapping voices, some leading to 30 years ago, and some referring to the days in the late February, early March of 2022. The two curatorial statements connect these two time frames. The first one, written before the war, provides an insight into the history of the artwork, which started in the mid-1990s in the city of Kharkiv, which at that time went through major alterations and disruptions of public space. And this situation um, is familiar to all the inhabitants of the post-Soviet urban spaces in the 1990s. There, exhaustion referred to a neoliberal takeover of the urban infrastructure, its livability perverted and exhausted by the drive to profit. The second, written um, on the 32nd day of the war, situates itself in already drastically devastated Kharkiv, hometown to the artist and one of the curators. And fortunately, this experience is unfamiliar to uh, most fellow East Europeans. <coughs> This fountain inverts the natural flow of water to form an image of the inverted course of history, <coughs> which right now seems to flow backwards towards the never again promises that followed after the end of the World War II. At the same time, it stays quite literal and factual as much as the artwork can be, a signifier for here and now condition of an utter exhaustion of people, but also places, objects, memories, hopes run over by the war. Connected to both of these statements, there are personal stories. Maria Lanko, one of the curators, packed the art piece in the trunk of her car in the first days of war and drove to the west to get to Milan and then to Venice. Lisaveta German, another curator, prepared to give birth to her first child in one of the Kiev's bomb shelters, but left in the last moment as the city was increasingly hit by the missiles. She delivered her son in Lviv and went to Venice with him. Boris Filonenko, curator, escaped collapsing Kharkiv for Lviv to keep working on the catalog of the pavilion and then join his colleagues and the artists later in Venice. Pavlo Makov, artist, spent the first weeks of the war in a bomb shelter in Kharkiv before he and his family su succeeded with their escape. Maybe a story of the artwork and people around it escaping the atrocities of war to get to Biennale in Venice would better fit in a book or a movie than in the biggest art Biennale. Or is it a clash of different realities, different geopolitical dimensions, and therefore different artistic contexts that we are dealing with here? In one of them, the idea of national pavilions is obsolete and outdated. It locks the artist into the shell of the national representation, and therefore it needs to be deconstructed as Hans Haake did with his project Germania in German Pavilion in 1993, or maybe inverted as Roman Ondak did with his project Loop in Czech and Slovak Pavilion in 2009, maybe swapped as French and German pavilions did in 2013. It can be given to local indigenous people as a Nordic pavilion this year renamed Sami Pavilion or maybe to trans-European minorities as um, Polish Pavilion also this year with the Roma artist Małgorzata Migratas. Or maybe it can be given to the neighbors who don't have their own pavilion, as the Nev Netherlands gave their pavilion to uh, Estonia also now. Yet in the other, representation at the international platform means voicing one's own right to exist, one's own agency to speak for oneself. Here, the national pavilion is a sign of sovereignty and equality, which can become obsolete only after the sovereignty and agency are left in peace, respect, and care. In this sense, the Venice Biennale is a perfect case study for the ambiguities of the allegedly post-national world firmly defined and articulated by the West, West. It tolerates empires, as long as they do not threaten it directly, accepts the Global South and the European East as long as they volunteer to deconstruct or redefine idea of the national and allows all other to make all possible sacrifices just to get the entry ticket. Yet another story from this Venice Biennial. In the war diary of a Ukrainian artist, Aliftina Kahidze, there are stories about her life with her husband and three dogs and a cat in a village Muzici near Kiev. Muzici was repeatedly shelled, 
Russian troops were stopped just five kilometers away. After they went over Bucha, Irpin, and Vorzel, the towns most people have probably never heard of before this war, but will never forget now. Aleftina's drawings are her visual comments on the news she wants to keep remembered. They are stories of her real and imagined debates with Russian and Western artists and intellectuals about the nature of this war, the role of the West, and responsibility of Russian culture. At the onset of the third month of the war, she drew a response to an open letter from German artists and intellectuals to Chancellor Scholz. And we know now that it was just the first letter, not the last one. The letter called to stop the recently approved supply of heavy weapons to Ukraine. Aleftina's drawings, drawing said, I could imagine Katarina Fritsch's next sculpture, the earth is supported by an elephant and Bundestag on it. And indeed, it shows the iconic elephant of the well-known German artist that opens uh, Cecilia Alemani's exhibition in the central pavilion of a current Venice Biennale. It balances a pretty flat earth on its head where a slightly tilted German Bundestag rests. And you can also see on the picture from the actual elephant and the actual exhibition in the central pavilion, there is a small picture, small colorful dot behind the tail of the elephant. This is the work of Maria Primachenko, which was added to the exhibition in the last moment after uh, the museum was bombed. There is no mention in the catalog, for example, of this work and Maria Primachenko whatsoever. Anyway, one could call this drawing ironic, but Kahidze is known for her blatant and disarming honesty that often makes people extremely uncomfortable. And her dedica dedication to the facts, and the facts in this case are that Katarina Fritsch was among those who signed the letter, that the earth is not flat, there are more buildings as well as countries and people than just the one with German Bundestag on it, and leaving Ukraine without weapons just means turning the country into one big 40 million people Bucha. There is a bitterness and utter fatigue in this drawing by Aleftina Kahidze. She is bitterly tired that on the third month of this brutal, murderous, unjust war, she still needs to explain simple and obvious facts to a Western audience whose names carry incomparably higher value in the art world, both in symbolic and economic senses, than her own. It is this value that allows them to be both influential and negligent, putting their stereotypes above lives of millions. Neither the Russian war against Ukraine nor the stereotypes and expressions of moral and intellectual superiority from Western observers and onlookers come from nowhere. The power structures behind them are rooted in two ruptures in recent history, 1945 and 1989-91. The first one cut the continent in half, dividing East and West, and de facto legitimized the existence or the existence, the imperial attitudes, and the totalitarian practices of the Soviet Union. The second one opened the path for the reunification of Europe on economic and social terms set by the West. The paradox, however, was that the collapse of the Soviet state did not mean the collapse of the Russian Empire. Neither did it lead to an equal and democratic Europe for most of the newly independent nation states that rose from this collapse. Russia kept the title of the winner of World War II, as well as its nuclear arsenal, while the West kept feeling superior as the sole winner of history, confirmed by Francis Fukuyama, among others. The countries in European East were still in between Russia and the West, immersed in what Habermas so aptly and ruthlessly called catch-up revolutions. Those in Eastern Europe, it appears, had to shuttle back and forth in time on the one hand to rediscover and restore their lost histories, but on the other to speed up to the present in order to get all the goodies that li neoliberal democracy had in store for them. The events of 1989-91 uh, created a cascade of different, often contradictory time ruptures. They lead to a crack within the communist realm where before only the edited the redacted, the written and imagined version of history was allowed. The images of the Berlin Wall collapsing under the hammers and crowds of people flowing over and through it, cheering and crying were too good 
not to be taken as an omnipotent symbol of the end of an era. Everything from that moment uh, on should have been post-communist, post-ideological. It was more than just the victory of one political system over the other. It was supposed to be the victory of the Western temporality, Western modernity replacing its Eastern rival. Newly formed or reinstated Central and Eastern European nation states made a triumphant return to European history on a glorious horse of velvet revolutions and democratic referendums, like in Ukraine. They have been finally liberated from their oppressive past. But what kind of past was left there? What could fill the opening void? The Western history of the 20th century was already done. It was complete. The right and the normal version of history where democracy and liberal values steadily won, reinforced by the powers of capitalism. And there was no space for other histories in it. In his seminal work on the horizontal history of the European avant-garde, Polish curator and art historian Piotr Piotrowski pointed out that in debates on overcoming historical and political isolation and restoring, re restoring normality in the eastern part of Europe after 1989, universal, the important word in a newly acquired vocabulary, always basically meant Western. However, what did this desired normality mean? Since Western liberal democracy already had everything in place, the value system, institutions, a continuous uninterrupted linear history, pre-war, post-war arts, all Eastern Europeans had to do was just to copy this framework as close to the original as possible. Political historian Ivan Krastev called it the imitation imperative. The problem with this imitation though even if it's done full-heartedly and with a diligent fervor, it's always secondary. Democratization, modernization, integration, liberalization, Europeanization, we all know those buzzwords that come straight out of the developmental aid vocabulary. Basically, they mean the same. They put Eastern Europeans, that just a moment ago were heroes who had bravely shaken off the repressive, repressive shackles of communism, on a school bench to learn the ABCs of their own new lives. And of course it was the West who was the teacher and the one eventually evaluating the success. And whatever they did, there were still Polish plumbers, Romanian strawberry pickers, and Ukrainian prostitutes in the eyes of the other. The result of the imitation imperative is unsurprising. It's emotional fatigue, a feeling of inadequacy, inferiority, loss of cultural identity, constant self-criticism, and finally, resentment. In his thinking on shame and guilt, a French sociologist and writer, Didier Ribon, refers to the feeling of insultability by social order. The condition of expecting or anticipating insults and humiliation, of being incomplete just by belonging to a certain marginalized social group. Can there be insultability by geopolitical order? If we are to accept that this feeling already existed under Soviet conditions, that it was induced by the way the Soviet empire treated its loyal subjects, making them inferior to the center, but most importantly, taking away their histories, their identities, erasing their temporalities, we can see where identity politics of Eastern Europe come from. In the aftermath of 1891, reclaiming cultural identities was seen as one of the intrinsic democratic rights. Eastern Europeans were regaining political sovereignty and subjectivity. They were opening archives and reaching out to anything that was banned and censored before. Language, religion, traditions. Regaining agency could not be complete without knowing who you are and where you come from. The jump from the constructed history of the Soviet world into the real history of the real world could not be complete either without rediscovering lost memories or an attempt to make a history out of them. The perspective of rediscovering and maybe even rewriting your own history was thrilling. It also had a much needed therapeutic effect, healing wounds of the past, mobilizing with a new found dignity and power for the present, helping to overcome inferiority complexes and giving a chance to become truly normal Europeans with roots 
and ancestry with heroes and great inventions, war sufferings, and victorious revolutions. The problem there was that from the perspective of the West, this quest to rediscover a cultural identity was deeply tainted. It referred to ethno-nationalism. It's the one of the reason for Nazism. The core myth of EU revolves around the post-national character of the Union itself and thus of its members. Eastern flirts with identity politics could be tolerated as long as there were just hiccups on the path to political and economical liberalization. The tolerance came to an end after the wars in Yugoslavia when nationalism came, made a comeback as the root of all evil. After the Balkan Wars, the process of what Ukrainian historian Tatiana Zhurzhenko called the new orientalization of Eastern Europe was completed. In a way similar to orientalization of the Near East described by Edward Said, the West deprived Eastern Europeans of their agency and reality. They were imagined as a certain homogenized entity, questionably capable of dealing with their own economic and political institutions. Moreover, they definitely were not capable of, uh, capable of learning history's most important lesson, that the true democracy was just not compatible with nationalism. Another side of the orientalizing gaze on the East and the triumph of the Western version of modernity was alienation of the communist history of the previous half century. It was seen as an externally imposed barbaric order. Married with a strong internal wish to alienate, alienate from the painful past experiences, this created a post-colonial phenomenon of a search for the roots of the lost and abused identity in the past beyond the immediate one. In this sense, Eastern European nationalism nationalisms were predomin predominantly cultural, desperately trying to stitch their European identity together, following up on the Czech writer Milan Kundera's metaphor of Eastern Europe as kidnapped West. They referred back to the interwar period after the fall of major empires when most of now post-communist states gained an attempted or attempted sovereignty. However, in the eyes of the West, the transition to democracy, this jump to an already existing reality was to be primar primarily focused on befitting the economic capacities of these newly emerging countries into the global market. Liberal, or rather neoliberal policies had no interest in identity quest, or what Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe, referring to his similar processes in post-colonial African societies, described as, I quote, the realization of a shared project to stand up on one's own and to create a heritage, end quote. When the label of cultur cultural nationalism overshadows the process of cultural attention, care, and learning, when the latter is denied as a tool of introspection, of knowledge production, when it's dismissed as a glitch and not accepted as a, a contested realm of doubting and questioning the given paradigms and normative Western narratives, it gains the poten potential to turn into a powerful myth-producing factory. In the last 30 years, artists from Eastern Europe and Ukraine in particular went over various stages of normalization and localization, attempts to visually and discursively fit into the art market and the agenda of the Western art institutions and to deconstruct the power structures behind it. But back to Venice. Three years ago, the Ukrainian pavilion in Venice, created by the artist collective Open Group, bore a title, The Shadow of a Dream Cast Upon Giardini della Biennale. On May 9, during the opening of Biennale, the largest cargo plane in the world called Maria, the Dream, was supposed to fly over Giardini and cast a shadow. On board of this plane would have been a hard drive with the registry of 1,143 Ukrainian artists and art groups that responded to curators open call and send in their portfolios to be participants in the Venice Biennale. Of course, the plane did not fly. The flight was impossible due to a number of bureaucratic complications, but it didn't really matter. Well, now it's forever impossible because the plane Maria was hit by a Russian missile in the first weeks of the war and is deemed irreparable. 
But the story of the pavilion was not about the flight, it was about the dream itself. Yet again, or in this case, also then, the Ukrainian pavilion was a multi-layered story, a critical narrative rather than a space or time-based artwork. The open group interweaved the, res the references to May 9, the Soviet Victory Day, which used to separate the Soviet World War II discourse from that of the West, and until recently still connected many countries from the former Soviet Union, an image of the biggest cargo plane in the world to signify never ending and never losing competitiveness that Ukraine is a part of the catch up world is locked in. And an attempt to create a truly open and horizontal art space where everybody can participate and no selection or judgment is provided whatsoever. The shadow of dream was a strong critique on the power structures in place in the global art world and their seductiveness. Curators played with the dream of being from an important and recognized country, even if it's just because of the production of the biggest cargo plane, or just through casting a shadow. The dream of having one own proper, even if elusive, space in a row of all other countries whose pavilions have been a part of the Biennale since 100 years, unlike Ukraine. The dream of writing the country and its artists' names into the history of the world art. At the same time, the long list of 1,143 artists deconstructed both the idea of national representation and the symbolic value bestowed upon them. In their curatorial statement, the open group referred to yet another tool of creating hierarchies and inequalities by mapping and articulating through the <coughs> external Western gaze. They refer to a MoMA publication from the primary document series published in 2018, titled Art and Theory of Post-1989 Central and Eastern Europe, a critical anthology. I quote, uh, a careful reader flipping through the end pages of this book would land on the maps of the cities that the members of the research team and curators from the institution visited. Amidst all the notable capitals of Central Eastern European countries, and not just capitals, a glaringly blank space appears in the place of Ukraine." End quote. Uh, referring to the exhibition Steps of Europe, the very first exhibition of independent alternative and non-conformist art from Ukraine that took place in Warsaw in 1993, the curators continue, and I quote again, it's those same Steps of Europe and just 25 years later, they are totally blanketed in snow. Even the capital is hidden under a thick blanket. This is not the first instance of an authoritative global institution's exclusion of Ukrainian art, seemingly from its own context as a key community in the region. And of course the question arises, why is our legitimization by institutionally developed countries so important to us, or to be blunt, by the influential professional community and the global market, end quote. As the open group stated, the MoMA publication was far from being the only surveying look at art of Central and Eastern Europe after 1989 that excluded Ukraine. In fact, until very recently, all major exhibitions, collections, conferences, and various art mappings either ignored Ukrainian art completely or showed a passing interest. If between 1990 and 2000, this could be explained by an oversight or a human error based on the vastness of the lands and peoples and contexts and arts that needed to be discovered and incorporated into the nor normality of the global art world. What about the snow blanket that remained between Warsaw, Vilnius and Moscow in the thorough research conducted in 2010s involving professionals from the region and extensive research trips? One might acknowledge that with the expansion uh, of the EU in 2004, 7, 13, the case of Eastern Europe was perceived closed. Even though the new members were still seen as somehow lesser Europeans, the historical wrongs were done justice to and the former West focused on reimagining itself as a global North and being burdened with doing justice to the global South. One could also follow uh, British art historian and critic Claire Bishop, who in her essay in this uh, MoMA anthology uh, notes the economic realignment between Western and Eastern European countries that slowly grew after 89. 
The Baltic states were drawn into a hip and thriving Nordic art scene through the economic expansion of Germany and Scandinavian countries into the region. The other gravitation hub for cultural funding, Bishop writes, was and remains Austria, which set its sight on Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans in a similar attempt to consolidate economic hegemony. However, Austrian investment, based on historical and cultural ties, uh, stopped on the border of the EU, uh, somewhere in Eastern Galicia. What was left between the Eastern borders of the EU and economic interest of the European heavyweights, on the one hand, and Russia, on the other, was a blind spot of multiple epistemological failures. A failure to grasp and name these lands and people that fell into the gap of whatever was east of Eastern Europe. A failure to acknowledge the political and economical drivers under this mapping exercise where the east of Eastern Europe was seen as a Russian zone of influence. A failure to admit political consequences of previous failures. All the emancipatory discourses that enabled the start of the debate on decolonization and moral responsibilities of the global north vis-a-vis -vis global south did not help the introspection of the former West and its power of naming, mapping, and silencing the East of Eastern Europe. It didn't help to acknowledge how historical sentiments and economic interests influenced and inflexed both mental geography and an art market to exclude Ukraine. This war that Ukraine is fighting today is a twofold decolonial war. On the main front, it's a brutal and unjust war against Russia, an outdated empire that cannot let go of its imperial territorial and cultural claims and is ready to eradicate the whole country for them. But on the other, not deadly but still crucial, it is a decolonial stand against the West that still holds the reins to the power to name to represent and to decide whose sovereignty is worth fighting for. As Ukrainian artist Nikita Kadan has put in one of his works done early in this war, in a bomb shelter in Kiev, we are the price. Thank you so much. Um, for me, this was the, the moment to cry. Uh, questions? Please just raise your hand and I will give the mic. You can also save your thoughts and questions and transfer them to the, the discussion afterwards. Okay, we, I think we all need to kind of digest and stay with it for a while. Um, then we will have a short break now, um, maybe 10 minutes uh, to catch up our breath and have some fresh air. And we'll return in 10 to 15 minutes for the discussion. So don't, don't go too far, stay with us.